Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, it's Neil Ross, of course, Managing Director of National Sales with Nine Point Partners. And it uh, gives me a great pleasure to once again uh, welcome you to our uh, most recent update uh, on our energy franchise. Uh, of course, the title of the presentation today, um, hopefully you can see it on your screen. That is our intention. Uh, Nine Point Energy Strategy, the multi-year oil bull market, and what it means for energy stocks going forward. Uh, our featured speaker, obviously, uh, today, as advertised, is Eric Nettle, who's a partner with Nine Point and also a senior portfolio manager. Before I th hand things over to Eric, I just want to remind everyone um, about Nine Point and what we do. Uh, Nine Point is a leading uh, Canadian alternative asset manager. Uh, we have total assets of a little bit over $8 billion. And that's a combination of our retail assets and also our institutional contracts. Uh, our headquarters is here in Toronto, and we have approximately 85 employees. And, you know, our goal in the industry and our sort of you know, raison d'etre is that we target strategies that are, you know, things that as an advisor, you, you typically wouldn't handle yourself, uh, typically alternatives, things that are uncorrelated to traditional asset classes, or have a low correlation traditional asset classes. And the idea of giving you, you know, specialty investment management um, and, and having the ultimate aim of reducing, uh, of giving you, you know, building block products that allow you to lower overall portfolio risk. You can take everything in the nine point product line, whether it be ETFs, mutual funds, liquid alts, hedge funds, LPs, um, whatever it is, and categorize them as either alternative income, um, alternative core strategies, uh, or real assets. And what we're talking about today is in the real asset realm and maybe a little bit in the alternative income realm, considering we have the, uh, the energy income fund. And then our mantra continues to be, our credo continues to be that Nine Point creates and manages alternative investments that allow investors to realize tangible benefits in their portfolios a better diversification. And without further ado, I will step aside and hand things over to Eric. Eric, please go ahead. Great, thanks Neil. And thank you to everybody joining, whether it's live now or uh, catching this on a, on a replay. I, when I crafted this presentation, I, it, it's, it's to be quite honest, a challenge because what we're talking about, what we will be talking about is our thesis that we've had for several years. And it's really not about like a flavor of the day and chasing new themes. It's a thesis that revolves around four primary uh, key tenets. And so it's more about watching those tenets play out and evolve as opposed to new dynamics. And so it's uh, for many of you joining, you will have heard uh, our thesis, how we're positioned, which we're refining uh, all the time. For some of you, this is all new. And so it, it's, it's a challenge to marry uh, those two or to balance those two uh, different dynamics. What our thesis, why we have generated the performance that we have generated so far, why we will generate the future performance I anticipate we will be able to achieve revolves around a core belief. And that is the world is in a multi-year bull market for oil. I'm gonna walk through the four reasons why that is. Essentially, there is a mismatch between demand growth and supply growth going forward. And it's that mismatch that is leading to inventories falling just as they have last year, propelling an oil price higher and higher and higher, ultimately to an oil price where you have to kill discretionary demand. What is exciting is today, in my estimation, at least in Canada where we're focused, our average holding is discounting an oil price of about $55 to $57 while we trade oil about $79 right now. And so for an investor, whether you're new to the sector, whether you've missed the past couple of years of gains and you're wondering, well, geez, you know, my Johnny come lately, how much further could there possibly be in the trade? Or if you have exposure and you're wondering, should I be adding or should I be trimming? You know, are the best days behind us? What excites me is that if you buy into energy stocks today, in my opinion, you're getting the possibility for when stocks re-rate to discount the oil price where we already trade today, let alone where I think we're heading in the months and quarters and, and years, frankly, uh, to come. And so that, to me, is the value proposition. You know, we've used the term uh, generational opportunity for energy stocks in the past. We still are incredibly excited with the risk versus reward uh, in this sector. And if you feel like you've, you've missed it, you are not alone. The vast majority of, of clients, of investors that we speak with uh, are, you know, modest weight. Many people have been, were kind of lulled into um, 
believing, you know, my God, the recession or OPEC or U.S. shale, whatever it is, and have prevented them from seeing what we see. What we think is 2023 is marking a turning point where the rest of the market sees what's, what some of us have been seeing for quite some time. So I, I want to spend maybe two minutes, three minutes reflecting on 2022. I really want the focus to be on the path forward, not where we've come from, but I just wanted to reflect on 2022. It was an incredibly challenging year to navigate. We had to deal with you know, the geopolitical tensions of Russia's invasion in Ukraine. Uh, some organizations such as the IA saying, my God, we're going to lose 3 million barrels per day, propelling the oil price up. But most importantly, my, my bullishness peaked right around June. It was an RBC energy conference held in New York where I had the opportunity to hear from and then later meet the Secretary General of OPEC, uh, Secretary Burkindo. Up until that point, we had been forecasting for a year prior that the world was heading into this very dangerous moment where we would be exhausting OPEC spare capacity, which acts as the insurance policy for the world in case you, know, you do lose 3 million barrels per day. And it was incredibly or satisfying to have Secretary Burkindo in the open conference later at a, a private dinner reinforce and in fact validate that message. Massively bullish event. But right around June is when you had the, the, the beginning of the Fed really starting to get aggressive on interest rates and really propelling almost like peak recession fears, although we've been maintaining that peak for quite some time now. And so it was that, that worry about the macro dominating the conversation and not allowing people to see what we've been seeing, which is this mismatch in supply and demand. And so we've had inventories fall, and I'll touch on that in a moment, and yet the oil price of, of fell. Uh, we had to deal with China COVID zero policies. So when I talk about last year was the year of energy investors against the politicians, and admittedly the politicians won, for now at least, at least 2022. You had the biggest release from strategic petroleum reserves in history, uh, apparently supposed to offset you know, lost production. You have a political organization like the IA saying, you know, we're gonna lose 3 million barrels per day. Was that cover to allow the US government to come release uh, the most amount of barrels in history, magically right before a midterm election, where we know that there's a very strong inverse correlation between presidential approval ratings and the gasoline price. And so they did everything they could to beat the you-know-what out of the oil price, and they, they succeeded for a, a brief period of time. And so that, that release from SBR has really cloudy the data that I think didn't allow people to see how tight the market truly was, because they'd say, well, geez, you know, builds are increasing. The IA is saying, well, you know, stocks are building. They're only building because you're, you're stealing it from the SPR, which is kind of one-time source of supply. What really matters is if you adjusted for that, inventories would have been falling. So fast forward to you know, a time such as now when the SPR ends and what's going to be the ultimate result is falling inventories and rising oil price. So we had the SPR. We had uh, the China COVID zero policy lasting, I think, much longer than most people believed. You know, a government forcing uh, their population for three years into extraordinarily restrictive economic situation impacting oil demand by anywhere from half a million to over a million barrels per day, depending on who you ask. And then we had, again, the noise around this EU embargo. Will it result in higher production? In fact, it resulted in higher Russian exports at the end of last year as Russia kind of front-loaded um, embargoes and basically pre-sold. Hence why conditions, I think, in December and January are a little weaker than people expect. Well, people just pre-bought -pre uh, those cargoes. And so it's really this dominating worry about, my God, we're heading into a global recession leading to a risk-off market last year, uh, which seems to be ceasing a little right now, which I, I think perverted people's sense of how tight the market is. And so we were calling for $100 oil. We got it several times. Oil sold off a couple of times. Oil averaged $94. So I still regard it as a win. But when we have, like our fund was up about 50% on the year, which in a, a relative context, you know, that's 70% beat to the, the S&P 500. You'd think that would be, you know, it would feel like a win, but I, I, I honestly, I feel a little disappointed. I thought we would have done uh, better. Our bias is more in the small and mid-cap stocks in any risk-off market. They kind of got pounded a little bit more than, than the large caps. And so as we enter in 2023, which is what I really want to focus on, I think any lost performance last year, in my opinion, is going to be made up uh, now as we enter into a risk-on uh, market. And so why is that? Before we get into that, I want to uh, spend maybe two, three minutes uh, touching on a, um, some key takeaways from a trip that I was fortunate to attend uh, last week. Uh, we were traveling to the Middle East for the very first time to Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Had the very, very uh, unique privilege to meet with His Royal Highness Abdulis bin Salman, the, the Energy Minister of Saudi Arabia, for two hours. He hosted us for 
reception and had lunch for two hours. It was an unbelievable experience. The second most powerful man in the world when it comes to uh, oil. The only more powerful is his boss. And then also meeting with His Excellency the Saad al Kabi, the Minister of uh, State of Energy for uh, Qatar. And so here you have the largest oil producer um, and then the largest LNG producer, soon to be. So it was a very unique um, views, both from those gentlemen and other ministers uh, that we got to meet. And so much of the conversations were either confidential or Chatham rule. So just from broad strokes, what are my key takeaways? This isn't a knock against uh, you know, our Western uh, political um, organizations, but what's unique when you're dealing with monarchies is that the ministers aren't being selected from a small pool where you've got everything from drama teachers to bus drivers and whatnot to choose from. You get to choose people that have unique skill sets and uh, a much stronger grasp of energy literacy than some of the people we've had, or at least that I've dealt with in similar positions in the West. And so the, the caliber of conversations and I'm going to say intellect and whatnot, at least specifically about energy, was embarrassing. Secondly, both populations are, are, are um, uh, essentially smaller, younger, very young, and hungry. You know, we visited the Ministry of Energy for Saudi Arabia at 8, 8.30 local time, and there were still people in the office. So this wasn't like what you may experience going downtown uh, Ottawa at 8.30 on, on a uh, Tuesday or Wednesday night. And so you have a government, both governments, with very, very strong visions to both grow the economy, that's both their hydrocarbons, contrast to certain jurisdictions. So not just grow their economies and their hydrocarbons, but diversify. Diversify away from hydrocarbons at the same time, while also building out the renewables. Saudi has the goal of, I believe, 40% of their grid being coming from alternative energies by 2030. And so these very, very, very aggressive, like when I say aggressive growth plans, this is literally building cities in the middle of nowhere where nothing exists in the moment. And this isn't some grand vision. This is shovels in the ground today. Very bold initiatives requiring very, very massive funding. Suggestive to me that many of the governments in that area uh, require a much higher oil price, or at least a floor than what would be commonly uh, believed today. And it was, you know, when I'm walking the streets of, of Qatar, where this city was, this country was essentially bankrupt after the 1940s when the, the pearl uh, industry uh, got kiboshed by a, a gentleman from Japan that did, uh, invented uh, pearl culturing. They had nothing. They discovered natural gas, it took time for the LNG uh, business to develop. And it wasn't until the early 2000s when they started to really get the windfall revenues from that. And so you're walking cities 20 years old that was all built from revenue from LNG. And it was a little depressing, frankly, when we're coming from, you know, I'm Canadian, uh, we, our audience is international right now, but from Canada, we're blessed with an abundance of natural gas. And just the, the contrast in visions, the interest in, in harnessing that revenue that decarbonizing revenue, because you can displace coal with it, it was it was quite contrasted. But my key takeaway was the very, very aggressive spending plans that are a political necessity for these governments to be successful, short, medium, and long term, require meaningfully higher hydrocarbon pricing, both LNG and oil, than I think most commonly believe. And it, it was an unbelievable trip, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful to Lima Croft, who, who are not only Lima could get us in to visit, you know, for two and a half hours with the. Uh, the different ministers. So why are we bullish on oil? When we look at, okay, where have we come from? 2021 was, you know, we've healed from COVID, et cetera. And a, a, a mentor of mine that I've, I've known for 18, 19 years, Mike Rothman, was, was the, the guy that taught me, if you're going to focus one thing, if you've got to choose one thing as your compass, it's oil inventories, because inventories are that nexus between supply and demand. And so what we've had the continuation of is the largest release or fall in inventories in history. Last year, we had global inventories, and we use a firm called Kepler that uses satellites. This, so this isn't just looking at the U.S., and it's not just trying to guess little areas. It's the most holistic measurement that you can get. It's not perfect, but no data set is perfect. This is the best that we can we can have, and it's, it's valuable and expensive uh, data that we use and we're sharing uh, with you. And so what this shows is that the, the, the deficit relative to average, we use 2017 to 2019, kind of a pre-COVID base. Some people say, well, gee, Eric, you know, you're, you're, you're manipulating the data. Why don't you go look at 2000 and compare inventories? Well, that's really stupid because demand over the past 20 years have grown by like 20 million barrels per day. So you need a lot more inventory. So we adjust for data of supply. We'll get to that uh, later on. So this is a relevant, I would say, normal period that we can compare inventories. So what does it mean? We came into early 2021 at a massive surplus, 250 million barrels. 
we exited uh, last week at about 194 million barrel deficit. Why is that? It's simply because there is a mismatch between demand growth and supply growth for the past two years. What's incredibly impressive is this includes the 260 million barrels, or a lot of it at least, that were released from strategic stockpiles by Western governments trying to get the oil price down to tame inflation with a midterm election. So, Mike, and at the same time, this has occurred where China, because of COVID zero policies, suppressed their demand by half a million to a million barrels per day. Well, if it's a million, that's 360 million barrels plus the 260. And so I posit the question to you, what happens in 2023? When the SBR largely ends, it was 260, now it's like 34-ish million barrels. So it's like down 90%. And China very, very clearly is normalizing. Some of the conversations we had with different ministries said, if we can get past Chinese uh, New Year, which I believe is this weekend, if we can get past that and you don't see any new restrictions, it's it's green light. It is like game on for full, full reopening in China. So you can start to have confidence in, in demand normalization there. And so what happens to inventories when the SPR largely is, is done and when China is normalizing back to normal, when you've had a, a massive population with trillions of dollars of savings that now want to live again, just like we did. You know, I traveled, uh, I took my family down to Disney in uh, December for four, for four days and there's no recession at Disney World. And so this yearning, this travel demand is continuing. So what happens when these very, very wealthy, large, large part of the population wants to live? And so that, you know, Pierre Andran on, on Twitter, I think very, very reasonably pointed out that the biggest underestimation of demand growth this year is going to come from jet demand uh, or jet fuel demand increase as you've got the emergence of China uh, once again. This is another chart, uh, U.S. inventories. I was asked in q and I'll, I'll address it now to you why we had the big builds the past couple of weeks. There's always um, shenanigans at year end around tax treatment, about inventories, whether you get taxed or not. So it's just, it, it muddies whether you know, you're spinning from one week to the other. I updated, uh, this chart is as of uh, two weeks ago. I updated this morning, didn't have a chance to put on Twitter. You're basically, the, the deficit relative to normal has has not really changed, but like 4 million barrels, it's around. So I think we're like a 356 million barrel deficit relative to average. So look at this chart. You know, you, what this tells me is that our thesis about the multi-year bull market in uh, 2019, 2020 was working. Then you had COVID, it deferred it by a, a year and a bit. We had to heal from that. And now look at, we've gone from 120 million barrel surplus to a 350 million-ish barrel deficit in the United States. And again, this is a, a really good graph I, we use from Raymond James that shows the inverse correlation between inventory trajectories and oil price. This assumed, you know, this. some people thought this was bullish three, four months ago. I think it's conservative. If we have demand growth of 2 million barrels per day this year, you know, the IA just came out yesterday and said 1.9. They always underestimate demand. So let's just go with two. Embedded in Raymond James' work would suggest that on a days of consumption, so measuring inventories relative to demand, this would be an oil price measurably above $100 later on uh, this year. And so there were concerns about, you know, 2022, you're the biggest release in SPRs in history. I don't know if you can see the mouse, but we, we fell from, you know, 650-ish million barrels down below a 400, lowest level in 40 years. We've got the midterm uh, behind us. Will we get a further release this year? That's not my base case. Do I think they're going to fill the SPR? That is not my base case. So I think you can just ab abolish the idea, both pros and cons of SPR and put it in the rear view mirror. There are some people uh, on Twitter, some people's opinions who, who might respect that say, well, China, you know, they're sitting on a lot of oil. What are they going to be like? Is this going to be US SPR 2.0 in 2023? If we measure where their inventories are, especially when you account for normalized demand now relative to a few years ago, we don't see inventories as all that high. You know, you're looking at about 80 ish million barrels higher today than where they were pre COVID, but you've had demand grow meaningfully on, an, on a normalized basis since then. And China doesn't use the SPR as a strategic you know, tool because they don't have midterm elections to have to worry about. They're not governed by a four-year election cycle. You know? And so it's much more of a strategic, when they, we call it strategic petroleum reserve, it's not a strategic political reserve for them. It truly is strategic in the event of a geopolitical event. And as we know, the world is getting more and more precarious, not less and less from the geopolitical uh, perspective. And so why are we bullish on oil? We're bullish on oil. We believe we're in a, in a um, multi-year bull market for oil, five, six years at a minimum, for four main reasons. 
The first of which is demand. I believe that the demand for oil will grow for at least the next 10 years, and that frankly, we will all be using oil for the rest of our lifetimes. There are concerns very clearly about, well, geez, you know, the Fed aggressive uh, Fed increasing interest rates, interest rates going around the world. We're going to deplete, deplete savings by June. We're going to go into regional economies. I saw a city today cut their, you know, global economy probably from 50% to 30%. Who knows? What does a recession mean for oil demand? I've, ta- I've spent time on this before, so I don't want to bore those who have heard it, but recessions do not necessarily mean falling oil demand. What they mean is a moderation in the rate of demand growth. Yes, during COVID, the last recession, demand obviously fell for obvious reasons. Prior to that was the financial crisis in 2009, when like the, the, the world's financial system was hours away from ceasing to function. If you don't think we're heading into another great financial crisis, which out, outside of like the perma bears, um, who were, haven't been in, in vogue for like 20 odd years, most people don't believe that that is the base case. Is it reasonable to see economic contraction in different geographies? Absolutely. Is an oil price at $80 already discounting that? I believe so, and so does Goldman Sachs and a piece that they wrote back in September, and they alluded to that most recently too. And so even if you believe they're heading into a recession, I still believe you can be bullish on oil because what people are forgetting about is you've, you've had four headwinds that are becoming tailwinds. The biggest one, or by far the biggest one, is China demand normalization of half a million barrels to a million barrels per day. A million barrels is equal to about 3% uh, GDP contraction, which was never happened in a post-war era. Um, uh, so we've got a lot of buffer there. Uh, uh, frankly, I just don't think people are, are appreciating. This is a, a wonderful graph that we use with permission from uh, Bernstein. We love Bernstein's macro work in oil. It's very differentiated. And this isn't a forecast, it's a model. And it's what gives me solace and comfort or confidence that I will have job preservation for as long as I wanted to. Because what this graph says is it says, okay, let's try to be as bearish as we possibly can be on oil demand. Let's assume massive hyper adoption rates in EVs, ignoring, you know, we need to produce more copper in the next 20 years to meet these than we've consumed in the history of humanity. Ignore the financial constraints on building out the grid to double power generation, you know, rare earth uh, or somewhat rare earth uh, availability. China uh, dominates like 95%. Forget all of those things. Let's just go there. We're all driving electric cars. Wonderful. Let's assume hydrogen actually works. Let's buy into have the confidence that uh, the current Prime Minister of Canada has in this, where you meet with other energy experts uh, over in in the Middle East. They're not quite so sure. But let's just go there. We're all using hydrogen. We're going to displace diesel. It's it's awesome. Renewable jet fuel. Let's, Let's go there. Let's assume the global economy doesn't grow nearly as much. Let's assume for every unit of GDP growth going forward, we consume less and less and less oil. The punchline is the demand for oil grows to about 2034. And so we've got at least 10 years of demand growth. Recent years, ignoring for COVID, demand's been growing by 1.2 to 1.4 million barrels per day. Let's cut it to a million. 10 years of demand growth at a million, we need to come up with 10 million barrels per day of new supply because demand's going to grow by that. I cannot, as a supposed expert in this space, identify where is that production going to come from? And that is why I am bullish on oil. I'm not bullish because, you know, demand's going to rocket forever and such, even though I, I think people are unbelievably naive and suffer from profound energy ignorance to know, okay, how is oil used? Let's assume we're all driving electric cars. What does an electric car drive on? Well, the wheels are made out of rubber. The road is made out of asphalt. They're both made out of hydrocarbons. People don't know that 40% of oil is used for non-transportation means, i.e. it's not burned, it's used in which things like plastics. And the biggest driver of, of consumption of oil in general is population growth, which the world's gonna grow by 27%, in areas where they, 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 they're not worried about decarbonization or building out an unreliable grid using more and more renewables. What they want is access to electricity. They want access to not using wood or dried cow dung in their homes, as hundreds of millions of people do in this world for cooking. And so this this naivety about, well, we're all heading towards rapid decarbonization, the end is nigh, is really perverting people's sense of the role of hydrocarbons. And we see it in some governments, without getting too specific, that are blessed with an abundance of natural resources produced in the most ethical and uh, cleanest standards of anywhere in the world. But that's we'll save that for another conversation where we have a lot more a time. And so the real, if you want to be bullish on oil, the really reason is about supply growth. We've spent a lot of time talking about U.S. shale. 
how there was a period of time that we had to endure as energy investors where shale growth exceeded demand growth globally from three little basins in the US, supplanted all of the demand growth on this planet. And it led to enormous challenges, the installation of a trillion dollars of shareholders equity, et cetera. That's in the past. I can tell you with supreme confidence that we are no longer in that hyper growth world. We're now in a post hyper growth world. What the heck does that mean? We think shale will grow by about four to 500,000 barrels uh, per day. We just had a, a former analyst from uh, Simmons & Co. I meant to look up his name, a really great guy. He runs his own firm. He does. Um, uh, he just did a road trip in Texas meeting with a lot of private and public premium guys. And he said, look, at, you know, expectations for half a million barrels per day, which is like half of what people thought last year was going to be, this time last year. Would you, Mr. CEO, Mr. Service CEO, take the over and under? All of I think the population was uh, the, the, the N was equal to 30. All 30 said we'll take the under. Why? So right now you have the continuation of the demand from investors saying you will not grow. And if you're going to grow like a couple percent, but instead I still need to be rewarded. Yes, I've had a good two years now, but the memories of the horrors of 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 2020 are still really, really fresh. And to compensate me for that soul sucking experience, I need to get paid and I'm going to get paid with dividends and I'm going to get paid with buybacks. That is starving these companies of the capex that they normally would have had to use for drill bit expenditures. At the same time, rather than out, outspending their cash flow on average 1.45 times during that, with that uber period of growth, they're now massively underspending. At the same time, what we're seeing is inventory life is now becoming a challenge. The BS that they all told us from decades ago, we've got 50 years of you know low cost inventory, break even $30, we're, we're the new Saudi Arabia, it was all nonsense. And we know that today. What we're seeing is year after year and recently, well results are getting worse. They're getting gassier, i.e. the marginal break even is going up. We have firms whom we respect like energy aspects saying shale, US shale will peak next year. And we even have companies themselves like uh, Scott Sheffield from Pioneer cutting their own internal growth forecast for the premium. So why is this unbelievably important? We're not for shale production growth over the past decade. Non-OPEC production would have been largely flat. And demand's grown by like 12 million barrels per day, give or take. So the crisis that we very clearly are in right now, we would have been in were it not for US shale. And now for like 50 different reasons of which we can be very, very confident in, the era of hyper growth of US shale is over. And so let's go with the IEA, who's chronically underestimated demand growth, 1.9 million barrels per day. US is going to be 1.5. Oh, sorry, 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 0.5. That leaves you with a 1.4 million barrel per day uh, gap. Where's it going to come from? OPEC, maybe a million barrels, give or take. Great. Let's say they can, they can satiate it now. 2024, where are the barrels going to come from when we have satisfied the second element or the third tenant of the multi-year bull market thesis for oil, OPEC spare capacity exhaustion? I mentioned how uh, we had the unique privilege to meet with Secretary General, uh, His Excellency uh, Barkindo, uh, June of last year, who validated our belief that OPEC was hurtling towards spare capacity exhaustion. We also have Amin Nasser, very, very respected um, a man, the CEO of Saudi Aramco, warning the world, saying, look it, we as OPEC, we as Saudi Aramco, cannot shoulder the, the burden forever. We need you, global super majors, to start spending again. Saudi Arabia, UAE, the two halves within OPEC, both are growing their capacity. UE is adding just over a million barrels per day. It's not coming on until 2025. Saudi Arabia is not fully coming online until 2027. And in a very good speech, I don't expect you either to be able to read this or to look at it. We reference this. I put this up on Twitter. It's an excellent speech by Nasser of Saudi Aramco saying we're deeply concerned because the, there are for a variety of reasons, which I'm going to touch on next. There are profound challenges to these companies being able to invest, but it's cycle time. These are not like shale wells, which used to be four to six months. Now it's roughly a year between spot of a pad and bringing it on. This takes four to six years. So even if the global super majors got their collective, uh, you know what, in, in line and said, okay, we're, we're very clearly in a crisis. Let's forget about decarbonization, vilification, needs to pay dividends, all of those constraints. Let's just start spending today. You're not going to see a drop of oil for four to six years. And that's the reason why I say we're in a multi-year bull market for oil. Why is it multi-year? It's because of cycle time. And so the fourth main aspect to our multi-year bull market thesis revolves around the inability of the global super majors to grow. 
We know on the left how spending has fallen by 45%. This is non-inflation adjusted, by the way, where inflation this year, we just had terminally in a North American or Canadian gas producer say 22 or 25% inflation. We're modeling about 15 to 20%. So this is non-inflation adjusted, down 45%. Companies very simply are not investing enough in new productive capacity. Why is that? The similar conversations that I have with Canadian producers, my US peers have with US producers, the Europeans are having it, and even more forcefully, because not only is it you've got to reward shareholders with dividends, share buybacks, delever, heal the balance sheet pain that was inflicted during 2020, 2021, et cetera, but now it's you've got to take money and invest in renewables because we've all had to pledge net zero by 2050. How are you going to get them? By investing in so-called dirty oil projects, that's taking you backwards from achieving that goal. I'm going to reference a study that came out yesterday, the day before, from Bernstein that said, because alternative energy stocks have been such miserable performers, which is a trend we would expect to continue, certainly relative to traditional you know, dirty oil, so to speak, that the, 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 eco, the, the most woke energy companies on this planet, which are European super majors, may actually use the spread in, in valuations and go use their paper or free cash flow and actually go buy alternative energy companies to help accelerate them reaching net zero status. So it's further starvation of that necessary investment in long cycle production, especially where you've got European governments saying, you know, we want to, we, we're in a, in a supply crisis. I know what we're going to do. We're going to slap you with a windfall tax, starve you even further of capital, and we're going to take that money and, and, and give it back to the taxpayer, i.e. incentivizing demand. It's just epic, epic level of ignorance. And so what do we see? Like Shell, they, they had something like $30 billion of potential investments in the UK. They said, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, not right now. We had a holding that we had to uh, uh, liquidate partially because of very, very, well, the warmest weather in many, 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 many decades in Europe. But they had exposure to European gas and Ireland said, yeah, thanks so much. We're going to slap a 75% windfall tax on you. And so these companies are just under massive, massive assault. And so we reference a study, this is before a lot of the additional nonsense, where because of the inability to invest in long cycle production, because most of the big projects of the past bull market, you know, from 2014, 2015 have been brought on, these com companies represent zero production growth between now and 2030. That's including company, countries like Brazil with growth. You've got to uh, account for depletion and, and declines elsewhere in the world. And so when you add it up, what, how does the multi-year bull market thesis conclude? Very clearly evidenced by falling inventory levels globally, even with the largest release in history from strategic petroleum reserves, inventories are falling. That's in the rearview mirror. 2023 as the most important oil consumer on the planet at the margin is emerging from a three-year lockdown, resulting in increased demand of half a million barrels to a million barrels per day. And as the SPR ends, as discipline continues, as U.S. shale is, is looking right into uh, the headlights of the, you know, the, the twilight train about to run them over, as the, the, the uh, European super majors can't invest, and as OPEC for the haves are saying, look, at, we're, we're doing our best, but it's cycle time. You know, Saudi Aramco said, if we could do any faster, we would. These things take time. And so what we see is ultimately inventories are going to fall uh, so low as to send a price signal to the market that if we can't grow supply, normally it'd be oil, you know, let's, let's theoretically say we go to 120, 140, 150, whatever the price is, there would have been the profit motivation of the global super majors to say, okay, great, you know, we're going to go start investing. My worry is their free cash flow will go up, but will that translate into more spending? My worry is that will result in more investment in alternative energies to fast, so supposedly fast track them achieving net zero status, um, status only elongating the tail of what we see coming. So if you can't grow supply, you've got to kill demand. You know, work that I'm doing with, with uh, internally is how low can inventories actually fall before you reach minimum operating levels? It's something that I, th I see happening in the next couple of years. And that's, that's like the ultimate, like prices got to go high enough immediately to kill discretionary demand, which is really, really, really hard. You know, you think about during lockdown at the worst of it in COVID, you know, we're all under house arrest, no one's flying, driving, you know, going to the groceries, you got your kids, like it was just, we all, it's too, it's, we're trying to forget it. It was awful. The global economy came to a standstill, and yet we still consumed 92 million barrels of oil every single day. 
The punchline is killing demand is very, very hard. And so the oil price has to go high enough and stay there long enough to kill discretionary demand and at some point in, in, um, lead to increased supply growth, whether it's from the super majors, whether it's from OPEC, somehow that's kind of the call. And so how do we make generational wealth for my clients, so that's my goal, with that as our backdrop? And I'm gonna touch on gas, I'll touch on services. We're gonna go right till uh, three o'clock because we've got loads and loads of questions and we've got um, uh, almost a thousand people on the line here. So how do we make generational wealth going forward? We're a global fund manager. We, we run the third largest um, energy fund in the world the last time we checked according to, to Morningstar. And so we, we do look everywhere, but we believe that the, the best opportunity resides where we happen to live, which is in Canada. Because if you buy into what I believe in that is there will eventually be a time when everyone else sees what we see. The realization on behalf of politicians, on behalf of investors, this is not a sunset industry. There does not have to be a just transition if we're gonna be using oil for the rest of our lifetimes. And so what I'm looking for is the re maximum re-rating in valuations of companies. And I think I'll achieve that by buying into companies with long dated reserves, 20, 30, 35 years or longer reserves, where because of the massive amount of free cash that they're generating both at today's oil price and where I think we're going, they have a commitment to use that free cash though to buy back shares. And so what we see is this is run at uh, $90 oil this, this year. Should companies choose, we have a sector that could be debt-free Q4 of this year. Very few companies actually want that model. Most are saying low, to, low debt, not no debt. But this is just theoretical to show just how bulletproof, in my opinion, the sector has become. And importantly, investors had to be patient in 2022. They had to be patient because they had to listen to guys like me, you know, BNN and Twitter saying, yeah, we're, we're working on it, but companies have to pay down debt. They've got to get to a level where they can withstand any, any uh, economic shock. And so while we're, we were working with boards, uh, many, many, many boards of all of our holdings, et cetera, it was like, okay, guys, so get your balance sheet where you want it. But then when it, you do, we want 75% or more of the free cash flow. What we're seeing this year, so I, I've got a graphic on the left. Finally, this is our time to get paid. Are we going to get paid in dividends? We just had uh, Birchcliff, not a holding, but they just increased, um, they followed through. They increased the dividend 10x, I think, to like a 9% yield. We've got large caps in Canada that we think are going to be paying a 10% or more dividend yield. Very, very attractive, which I think will drive a re-rating. Our focus is more on buybacks. I'll touch on why that is. But uh, this is a graphic from an RBC report the past couple of days using script to call it 80. The work on the right-hand side is our work at $90 oil showing that we think on average we're going to get about 65% of free cash flow for the sector uh, this year. So you can uh, kind of pick your, your oil price. So very, very juicy uh, rewards. When I look at valuations, you know, the $80 on the top, $100 on the bottom, so maybe that's the first half, second half of you. What we're looking at are companies still trading at around two times enterprise value to cash flow um, at 80. Uh, we can buy companies below two times at 100. They used to trade at eight. We say, okay, forget that. You know, we're going to use a four to six target multiple, which triangulates to about a 10 to 14% free cash flow yield, generally speaking. Free cash flow is really the metric that we like to use. The sector is trading at a 15 to 22% free cash flow yield at 80 to $100 oil. And importantly, it's not like last year where the free cash flow is going to the banks. It's now coming into our, our pockets. At the same time, like again, we, we historically have uh, done uh, decently. We, we, according to Morningstar, we're the number one uh, performing traditional energy fund in the world two of the past four years. Helping us achieve that is the inefficiencies in the market because so many of my peers turtled and they either became ESG funds, they couldn't hack the stress anymore, they got fired, the banks changed it into a resource fund or something else. So there's very few of us left. And what that's leading to is a market very inefficient, meaning there's not as many guys willing to do the work either having the financial capabilities, the manpower between uh, my analyst, uh, Keegan and myself, we have every company, generally speaking, North America modeled out between 70 and 120. So it helps us navigate, okay, where do we want to be? Do we want to be in services, natural gas, oil? What's the free cash flow? What are we going to get paid? When's the catalyst, et cetera. But because very few people do that, what we see is we can buy what we believe are the best companies trading at average or below average valuations, which makes absolutely zero sense 
in the world. And so we've used this chart in the past. It's still very relevant today. We're, we've, we're the largest public investor in, in the Clearwater play. It's a play in Alberta, wildly economic, uh, very prolific wells. They don't have to be fracked or stimulated. And so these wells are, are have paybacks, so you get your capital back in a matter of months. And a rule of thumb used to be a year and a half it was good. Now it's like a month, two months, three months. So we can buy into three companies. This is all publicly released, of which we're the largest shareholder, second largest shareholder, largest shareholder of, and we're paying below average for the best rock in North America. To us, that's an opportunity. When we look at why do we not need a generalist investor ever to care about the sector again, even though they are, it's because we've been successful in changing the philosophy of companies to adopt a, a return mindset, meaning what they've said to the world very publicly is, if you don't see the value in our paper, we do. We're going to use our free cash flow. We're going to cap growth. And we're not seeing any degradation of that whatsoever. And instead, what we're going to do is use our free cash flow to aggressively buy back our stock. And so we've had some of our holdings. So we had a, a, a small cap or mid cap uh, money guy, which were number two after Jim Riddell say, we reached our leverage metric. Now we're going to give you 75%. And it's going to be a enormous close issue bids and probably an SIB, I think, ultimately as well, because the stock we think is profoundly mispriced. So at $100 oil, where we think we will be, the average company north in Canada can privatize with six years of free cash flow. What does that mean? Our average holding has about 15 years of state flat inventory. So my math, I'm going to give you an example of, of a large holding of ours. This would be a, a top three position just for compliance. So we, we leave it unnamed. This would be a mid-cap Canadian oil sand company's pure play, 35 years of reserves. This, uh, to, so what you'll see is an example we have it modeled out between $70 to $120 oil. We're using a $20 differential this year, $15 uh, next. And so this is a company where because they generate so much free cash flow and they will achieve their ultimate leverage metric by the end of this year, we, they publicly said you're going to get 100% of the free cash flow. So what the heck does that mean? Why are we such a big uh, advocate for meaningful share buybacks and how can that drive a re-rating? Well, this company uh, this year at 100 at a $20 differential, if you use 50 next year, it trades at a 23 to 34% free cash yield. Okay, what does that mean? They can privatize, they can buy back all of their shares outstanding at the current share price with three to four years of free cash flow. And so why is that important? Math is, okay, I've got 35 years to stay flat. If I'm only paying for three to four of them, I'm getting about 30 years of reserves, production, cash flow, free cash flow dividends for free. Well, 30 years, these guys we think are going to free cash flow anywhere from a billion to one and a half billion dollars. So I'm getting 30 to 45 billion dollars of dividends for free. And an example that we show on the right is, okay, why is that powerful? So what we show is, okay, if the companies, if this company follows through on what they've already said at either 80 to 100 dollar oil on the right, look as they buy back their shares, look at the expansion of free cash flow per share. This is with flat production and flat commodity price going from 470 to six to nine to 16, well, the stock trades at $19. So even at $80 oil in four years time, if they use, if they do what they've already said they're going to do, the stock's trading at a 82% free cash flow yield at $80 oil in four years, and they still have 30 years of reserves at that point. The $100, you kind of run out of runway because they're privatized by 2027, and by 2026, they're only trading at 162% free cash flow yield. So it's a very simplified example it uses a static share price. More sophisticated, we'll say, well, Eric, that's really stupid because as they buy back their stock so aggressively, the share price is going to go up. It's going to take them much longer to privatize. That's the point. My, my intention is not to be running a PE fund. It's not to have the entire sector privatized. It's to convince boards that in their, their hands, they have the power to drive the re-rating in valuations because these companies should not be trading at two and three and four times cash flow. The only reason they do is that the average energy ignorant person believes that this is a sunset industry. We need to transition them. And why would I pay for a barrel to be produced four, five, six, seven, eight years from now when we're not using the stuff? And that is why I still think energy stocks represent a generational opportunity. We are not that far, in my opinion, from that, that inflection point when the average energy policymaker, the average politician, more importantly, the average investor realizes that this is the only game in town, or at least the best game in town from a performance perspective. And so I'm gonna very briefly touch on uh, two funds in the next three minutes, and then we're going to um, uh, take questions. We've got 35 of them printed off. We've got 28 of them in the inbox, so I'm gonna talk even faster than I have now. Nine Point Energy Fund. This is available in ETF of uh, version or mutual fund. 
to Canadian and international ex-US. For US investors, I see a question, why don't you offer it? It's something we're working, we're trying to, to work on, just SEC rules makes it a little more challenging. Uh, so this is a fund with the intention of, our strong core belief is we're in a multi-year bull market for oil. My goal is how do I make the most amount of money for my clients with that view? We can go anywhere in the world. Where it's taking me today is in Canada, in mid-cap and oily stocks. We have very little natural gas, I'll touch on that in Q&A, and no services at the moment. We feel the best opportunity is in companies with multiple, multiple years of reserves for which we're not paying any, where we can own five to 9.9% .9 of the company. We have an indirect board seat. We've had very polite conversations and I've got everybody on side uh, to, to, to adopt the philosophy, the religion that my clients, energy investors at large, need to get paid to compensate them for the misery of the past decade uh, for the sector. So yeah, I'm very, very proud of the performance. We work our butts off and uh, we, I, with the best client base in the world. This is the third largest uh, traditional energy fund um, in the world, and it's the best performer according to Morningstar 2 of the past uh, four years. A fund we launched in about March of last year is the Nine Point Energy Income Fund, different fund trying to address a different challenge. Most clients, uh, or many clients would say, Eric, that's, that's great, but I'm older, I want lower vol, I want more income. So this is a vehicle in which we've, we've designed a strategy to maximize yield by two ways. One is we buy variable dividend companies with a bullish view on the commodity. We're at 80 to $100 oil. We think we're going to make about 8 to 10% in dividends, but then you've got to take off uh, fees and Forex and, one, and, and whatnot. That's after withholding tax. So 8 to 10% take off 2-ish percent. That gives you 68%. That's not where the juice is. The juice is in selling covered calls on a one month basis, basis on the entire fund, which we've been successfully doing since April. And so in exchange for capping our upside on a one month basis, at about 15%, we're making 16% annualized from those calls. And so what we would expect is if we can make 16 on the calls, about eight on the dividends, that's 24, you've got to take off expenses. We got hit last year with some Forex. We hedged our, our foreign exchange. Um, and because we were rolling it every month, we had losses, um, even though you're told it's costless, we had realized uh, capital losses and our options are capital gains. So that neutralized some of it. It's so long as the, the, the US dollar doesn't con continue to massively appreciate, we would expect to be able to uh, return on a cash on cash basis, 10% or more. That, that is our goal. It's not a promise, it's not a pledge. We're paying out about six and a half right now but that is our goal for 2023. Um, if our dividend went to zero with no hedging losses, with what we were doing just on the option book by writing options, we would have been able to achieve that. So if you think that there is a double left in the shares, as some of us believe, this is not the fun for you because we're capping our monthly upside at about 15% historically. We've got the other product for you. If you're looking to seek maximum monthly income from people that, that really, really work their butts off to quantify um, dividend potential to see opportunities that others may not be seeing. This is the fund for you. So it's two very different strategies seeking to uh, to solve two very different uh, problems that people have. So that was longer than I intended. It usually happens that way. I, I apologize. Uh, let's get to uh, questions. I don't know if Neil's going to moderate or I've got 34 of them printed off. We've got 32 in queue and I'm going to go through as, as fast as I possibly uh, can. Okay. Well, I think... Um... I've been looking through the questions and looking for ones that uh, are things you haven't covered and uh, and just trying to uh, to manage this long list. It's a good problem to have. So um, let me just uh, plug ahead here and, and get right into some of them. Um, so we have kind of a straight up question, which is, are you planning to build up a cash position to take advantage of a pos possible recessionary oil pricing uh, over the next year? So we, we know this is the most talked about recession in the history of humanity, measured by how many people are forecasting it. We have Goldman Sachs suggesting the current share price or oil price fully discounts a global recession. We have a gentleman like Mike Rothman saying that where inventories are today, there's a fundamental price of oil today of 120. We're trading $80 barrels. And then when I look at if I just use where oil is now, even haircut it, where stocks are discounting 55 the risk is trying to be too cute about the most forecasted recession in history relative to seeing names where you still see very, 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 very meaningful upside and missing out on that. I think that would be a profound error. And so we, we're always 
we're active, we're opportunistic, we're very nimble, uh, but my bias now is to be fully invested. At, at what point will institutional investors return and ignore the demand decrease rhetoric? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, it, so it, we all hear, especially with Davos going on now, you know, rapid decarbonization. Even though you're seeing some of the people that were saying, you know, this is this industry is over, starting to say, well, geez, you know, maybe we'll be using it for the next 20, 30, 40 years, and that we need, you know, an all of the above uh, solution. So long as companies continue to aggressively buy back shares, we do not need a single institution on this planet to care about this sector ever again for stocks to go up meaningfully, because companies themselves become the buyers of their own stock. Given that stocks are, are energy stocks in the S&P are now just over 5%, I believe, the S&P 500, that's a very important psychological level to be material enough for investors to have to care. Much of the, the qualitative feedback that I'm getting from uh, my peers, from energy salespeople, et cetera, is you know, more and more pods are opening up, more and more tech analysts are now changing their stripes and becoming energy analysts, which is, you have no idea how so warming that is after the misery that we've had the past five years. And so I, I believe that we're, we are there. Once people actually believe that China is emerging from a three-year lockdown and they start to realize that a recession does not necessarily mean falling oil demand, it's just moderation in growth and demand, I think we're there. Yeah. Now, you alluded to um, in one of the slides talking about privatization. Like, do you think there'd be companies that will go private as a result of all this free cash flow? No, I don't. I think they will re-rate their share prices high enough to mean that it takes much, much longer than three, four, five, six years to privatize. My goal has never been to privatize. It's to drive the re-rating and make my, my clients as much money as I can through, through um, that strategy. Have you noticed any deviation from commitment to flat production and prioritizing SH returns? No, shareholder returns. No I, no, I have not, and we will not. Any boards, any company CEOs that decide on that, I believe will be fired by their shareholders. You alluded to this, I think, when talking about share prices a minute ago, but I'll ask it anyway because I think it's a common question. Is a recession priced into energy markets? Yes, I believe it is. What do you expect dividend increases to be over the next 12, mo 12 months on average? So it, it, it's very company specific. We model them all out. Um, it's been deferred a little because you had differentials widen out, oil sold off. Um, on, on, so it's very, very company specific. And I, I don't want to get company specific given this forum and its compliance uh, issues. I'll be on BNN in a week or two. Hit me up there in terms of company specifics. But I, I think what we've seen recently of companies initiating um, meaningful, like continuing their NCIBs, uh, in, enacting meaningful, significant issue bids, which is new to Canada. It'd be like in the U.S., it's the same version of we've got 10% buyback constraints. You, you Americans don't have that. This is the way to get over that. And then some companies are going to do an all of the above. So it'll be buybacks plus dividends. We have companies where we think at $100 oil, they can pay a 10% dividend and buy back 15% of their stock, their shares outstanding. Um, in the larger group of questions, there are a few questions just about the role of natural gas exposure in the portfolio. And I also yeah. see a question about um, sort of a separate area, solar, wind, and ethanol. Sure. Maybe you could just okay. so, speak about so all four. So we go anywhere. So my goal is to, to make my clients as much money as they possibly can in the best opportunities available. My own belief is that alternative energy companies are horrible businesses. Most of them require government subsidies to be able to keep the lights on. And so that's not a business I want to invest in. There's no competitive advantage whatsoever, generally speaking. And as we saw last year, they're exposed to massive inflationary input costs. So if coal goes up, which, you know, who in the world was expecting that? Some, but not everybody. Suddenly, you know, your, your business viability just went down because you're negative margins. Horrible business. Uh, natural gas. We've just had the, the warmest winter in many, many decades in North America parts of North America, um, in Europe. We just had a first um, injection ever for the, in the month of January in North America. So we're going to end this winter probably at higher than normal. We have about 4 BCF a day of supply growth this year in the U.S., and you have no increase in LNG uh, offtake until 2024 and 2025. So the next year, year and a half for gas is not looking awesome. The question is when do people look through that 
to see once we start really inflecting on increased U.S. LNG takeaway and finally uh, LNG uh, offtake in Canada in 2025, that's a very meaningful game changer. And so don't be surprised if one day, rather than being 90-ish percent oil, we're 90 percent natural gas. That day's probably going to come. It's just not uh, today. And services were not there. You know, a lot of the drill bits spent in Canada is natural gas that is imploded. Uh, free cash yields are attractive, but not as attractive as what we hold if you believe in a slightly higher oil price. So we, we still, we're, we're looking, we're always looking for opportunities, but where we want to be is in Canada, in mid-cap, in, and in oil. Okay, Eric, there are a lot more questions. Let me just have another quick look at the ones that are piling in here as we get to the end of the hour. Um, Canada, so again, about, about natural gas and specific, specifically LNG, um, Canada is blessed with resources. We can develop LNG to take others off coal. Do you see LNG developments on both the east and west coasts yeah. supporting Germany and Japan have both have asked? So we just had the Blueberry uh, First Nation settlement finally. It's been like three years in, in the making. I think that, that clears the way for Shell to approve phase two. My guess would be that's coming. Uh, soon. So that's a game changer for, for Canada in terms of increasing our capacity. But again, it's 2025, 2027-ish, give, give or take. It's still way behind where it should be. Um, and that's a whole other conversation. I wrote a piece in the Financial Post uh, talking to that. I mean, if kids' activities allow me this weekend, I'm going to write finally a column. I'm just taking a break on just the contrast in energy policies, East versus West, and tie LNG uh, into that. But it, it's It's coming. Even if, even if we don't in Canada, we still benefit from uh, U.S. because that, that, that tightens the North American market and increases ultimately Canadian gas. So even if we can't get our act in order, the Americans are uh, actively and they will uh, indirectly ben benefit us. Okay. Well, Eric, I think we leave it there. Um, thank you so much for such a robust presentation. As, as I always say, um, really covered uh, pretty much all facets of the discussion. Um, but maybe I'll, uh, as we sign off, um, I'll say a couple of things. One is that obviously, um, you know, we distribute the fund through financial advisors and also these funds through institutions increasingly, um, you know, for advisors on the line, um, feel free to be in touch with your nine point uh, wholesaler and we'd love to take the conversation further. And, um, you know, we feel very optimistic about the year to come and, and uh, we're happy that you invested this hour with us and we appreciate your time. And uh, we'll, we'll give the uh, featured speaker the final word. I'll hand over to you to sign <laughs> off. Go ahead. We remain, we remain bullish. It's a cheesy tagline. It's an inverse of what uh, a former boss used to use uh, 15 uh, plus years ago. <laughs> but when you, when you look at the, the massive, profound headwinds that we had to deal with last year, where stocks still went up by 50%, and those headwinds in 2023 are becoming massive, massive tailwinds, when we can meet with the most important people in the world when it comes to energy policy and walk away as or even more bullish, when we see U.S. discipline uh, holding, when we see shale maturity, meaning that you know we're, the, the horrors of million barrel per day growth via shale are over, when we see politicians around the world still vilifying and attacking the sector with windfall taxes, strangling them of the necessary money to sufficiently invest, in a product which we all use every single day, and were it not for oil and hydrocarbons, we'd be literally back in the Stone Age, living in caves. And so when we look at the valuation of energy stocks today, the commitment that they've made to return all or most of all the free cash flow back to us, given what strong balance sheets they have, I don't know how for much longer everyone else cannot see what we very, very, very clearly see. And so we remain bullish. We think 2023 is going to be a very another strong year for energy investors. And we thank you so very much for your time today.